uh, defense has to uh, be the main thing for like commercial world, that's okay. Uh, but now tell your governments that the cyberspace they just announced as the next war uh, for armies uh, is not going to take place. So it's a bit, maybe, I don't know if there are some official entities now. We are moving back to in real world wars versus like cyber wars. That's a kind of a different dilemma. But I think this uh, presentation actually plays right at the hands of the next speaker, Mr. Njich Kern, uh, who is the permanent secretary of the Smart Nation and the Digital Government Office and the chairman of the Government Technology Agency in Singapore. And Singapore really has some initiative where they are trying to put some order into these IoT things and policy. And let's see, you know, how he addresses some of the challenges of the IoT space in terms of regulation and policy. So welcome, Mr. Eng Chikern. It's hard to... Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, the topic today was rather broad, so I had to find a way to narrow it down. And I must say, the two uh, speakers that came before me has, uh, has covered quite a lot of the stuff that I wanted to speak about. And one of the ways in which I narrowed down the topic was to actually want to talk about the Internet of Things rather than uh, just digital in general. Because for the same reason that Bruce said, uh, the Internet of Things is about the physical world and it kills, whereas the digital world about electrons, it doesn't kill. And it becomes more important whether we can, in fact, secure uh, the Internet of Things as compared to just the uh, purely digital world. Uh, this is an issue that is critical for Singapore to answer since we are a pretty digitalized uh, society. Some of you may know, uh, back in 2014, our Prime Minister announced that we wanted to transform Singapore into a smart nation. We envisage Singapore to be a leading economy powered by digital innovation as well as a world-class city with a government that gives our citizens the best home possible and that will respond to their changing needs. I, I personally lead the Smart Nation and Digital Government Group under the Prime Minister's office. We plan and prioritize key Smart Nation projects uh, and we also promote adoption and participation from the public and industry. One of the key projects that we have actually set up to do is to launch the Smart Nation sensor platform. And this involves deploying uh, hundreds of thousands of sensors and other IoT devices island-wide. And we plan to use this data collected to make Singapore more livable and secure. So for example, in our housing estates, where more than 80% of Singaporeans live, the use of smart meters and analytics help citizens to save on utility bills. Our Ministry of Transport is aggressively putting autonomous vehicles on the road, not just in trials, but we'll be running full fleets, operational fleets of buses uh, soon. The Ministry of Health is transforming medical care in our hospitals, where IoT is also extensively used in our hospitals. So, IoT systems are tightly bound to cyber physical systems, and as I said, these systems kill, and that's why we are... Uh, very serious about cyber security for IoT. Um, some of the examples of why it's so important, I think Bruce has gone through, so I, I won't uh, belabor the point. Um, I, I, I'll go straight to uh, then how do we approach this idea of trying to secure uh, the Internet of Things? And the short answer is similar to what uh, Dorit and Bruce have said we can't secure everything. And the fact that you will start the mindset that we can't secure everything means that. In a way, we can become more focused. We don't dilute our efforts by trying to do too much. Uh, we have a framework whereby we decide what are the more important things we have to secure. And the framework we use, uh, it's mainly you know, the CIA uh, framework, confidentiality, integrity, and availability. For confidentiality, it is context aware and situational. In the Internet of Things, many individuals and entities are involved in the process of data collection. And therefore, privacy considerations and policies will have to become context-aware and situational and hence more complex to process or to assess. Privacy risks of IoT 
depends on the amount of personal sensor data collected. For example, the usual emphasis on conventionality is not required for soil moisture sensors deployed in a smart irrigation system. While the availability and integrity of such systems remains vital to ensure smooth operations. On the other hand, IoT systems that enable e-health solutions such as remote patient monitoring would place heavy emphasis on confidentiality. Personal information gathered from these IoT systems could reveal that a person suffers from specific illnesses and could be used for specifically attacking that person. So within the Singapore government, we are undertaking a comprehensive revamping of our system of data classification that would allow us to address data and treat it according to its sensitivity or confidentiality. But for IoT systems, as what Bruce says, even more important than confidentiality is actually the integrity and the availability of the system. With IoT capable of actuation, we are able to give autonomy to the objects and to enable automated decision of physical world actions. But what happens when cyber attackers can now cause real world damage? For example, smart grids meters can be hacked by an attacker to cause a major blackout. As physical systems rely more heavily on sensor data for crucial decision making, the integrity of sensor data collected by these sensors with cyber physical implications becomes critical. Uh, I, I think in this country, you, you know better the consequences of compromising the integrity of a system. I think that's what you did with Startnex and the Iranian centrifuge. So, <clears throat> so the customization of systems to protect integrity, in a way, is more important than systems to protect confidentiality, and this is not something that uh, traditionally, the architecture of digital systems is focused on. A third risk is about availability in the provision of IoT-based services. A very important challenge is to ensure availability and continuity in the provision of these services and to avoid any potential operational failures and interruptions. This is especially important where the IoT supports critical operations. For example, Considering the case of connected smoke detectors that informs emergency responses, the smoke detectors may be programmed remotely to not alert the relevant authorities in an emergency situation. To avoid this, we look through our systems and we will diversify, look into diversification and resilience uh, architecture of our IoT systems and make sure that there's sufficient redundancy for important and sensitive sensors. But to differentiate systems according to levels of CIA confidential integrity availability that we have is technically complex. In addition, and moreover, in addition to the traditional CIA, I would add another C, so it becomes CIAC, and that is uh, connectivity. It is not just about how sensitive a, data, a system by itself is, or not just about how sensitive the data inside is, but it's also about how well, how extensively connected it is to the rest of the system. This makes uh, the risk assessment of a system a lot more complex. In other words, if a system is compromised, how likely is the attacker able to then compromise the rest of the systems? So this is the fourth uh, uh, factor that we use to assess our systems and to uh, sort of guide us on how much protection to give the system. I've looked so far mainly on the technical challenges and the technical assessment of uh, the IoT systems, but I think uh, participants in this seminar are, are more than just technical people. And as Bruce says, a lot of the response, if we are to be successful, will come in more than just technical means. We have to go beyond the technical. We have to do well in policy and regulations, so, and moreover, to be able to work well with businesses to implement uh, some of these policy requirements. And not only that, we have to also focus on education, training, and building up a big pool of experts in all these fields of digital technologies, and not just in narrowly cyber security, but also in uh, data engineers and scientists, as well as AI experts, as these techniques can be used to create effect in cyber security. They're all complementary. But given the time that I have, I will only briefly mention two particularly big policy challenges that I think we face. First. It is about how to bring business and operations people together. I think Bruce uh, alluded to that somewhat. 
unless the technical people have a clear understanding of the operational requirements or the business requirements of systems, it would result in either overprotection or uh, insufficient protection, and it will also result in a lack of coordination that overall decreases system stability. And moreover, the cultural divide is not just between business and technical people, it is about a difference between the cyber security type technical people and the, say, developer type technical people. Uh, in, in, a, in the developer community, the mantra, you know, this thing about uh, being agile, start small, uh, build fast, the whole mentality is that when you big, build small, you are not really very concerned with the heavy uh, cyber security requirements, you're not very concerned with uh, uh, the regulatory requirements and you, you just start and you, you know, the whole notion of uh, security by design is really quite uh, mis misleading. There is very little of uh, uh, security by design in so much of what is being built. And the focus is really just on uh, good user experience and good user features. To try to add on good cyber security features later on is then not just difficult, but I think in many cases it's just about impossible. So if you want to do better in this, I agree with what Bruce says. Uh, governments, businesses have to make our requirements known, particularly for those aspects that we really want to protect. You, you can't apply the typical agile development where you start small, disregard uh, regulatory requirements, disregard cyber security requirements, and just hope that uh, it can be add on later on. Uh, a second policy uh, challenge that I see is about how industry can participate in uh, IoT security. We need a model where the industry and government work hand in hand to combat IoT threats. Instead of the government just being a regulator, we could offer our IoT systems as test beds for the industry to obtain data and telemetry to customize their solutions. With access to data from government IoT systems, the industry can then invest in R&D to improve the overall security posture of IoT systems. Uh, this may not be true in all countries in the world, but in Singapore, where the government uh, demand is significant, uh, it can be a very useful way. So as part of our uh, Smart Nation Sensor platform that I mentioned to you earlier, we are using smart lampposts in Singapore to engage the industry to develop and test bed feasibility of IoT security standards. Uh, we just came from Ag uh, visiting Argus this morning on uh, vehicle cyber security and offering test beds where uh, companies like that can test their cyber security systems uh, and solutions would also help because they help inform the overall uh, uh, development of, of, of these uh, cyber security systems and uh, architecture. And it is not just domestic issues. Governments have to work together to put more pressure on companies to really build many systems that are security by design. These companies are too global and too big for any single government to be able to put enough pressure on, other than perhaps the US or the Chinese governments. From what I've said, I think you would have the sense that I agree with the two previous speakers that we can't protect everything, we can't secure everything, we have to choose what we want to protect and then invest more effort in protecting those that we really need to protect. Um, most governments and most companies actually don't have the expertise to think enough or think more deeply as to what they really want to protect. The lack of expertise is uh, important and that's why I say it goes beyond policy, it goes beyond even regulatory and technical issues. It is about how we can build up a big enough pool of uh, um, uh, manpower. So in Singapore, the government works with the private sector, for example, where private sector companies train more people in cyber security, data science, AI techniques. And I think this is a model that perhaps can be used in other countries too. So uh, I would just like to repeat uh, in conclusion one message I've heard many times in this cyber week, which is that if you want to have any chance of being able to protect many things, not even everything, governments have to collaborate more to establish international norms and standards and to work to get businesses to buy into these international norms and standards. Thank you.